Greetings and a warm welcome to Shishobo as we bring you another powerful word by Bishop Musasono. As you watch the sermon, we trust that you will find this teaching to be practical and life changing. Here's a reminder of what we covered last week. And therefore, family or a home, when you read scripture, is God's idea in the first place. In some way, He's saying, even when I visit you as God, I'm not going to only touch your life, I'm interested in your family as well. Thank God for parents who taught me as a child that when I leave and go somewhere, I must tell them where I'm going, who I am with, and when am I coming back. We used to get uh, pocket money for school, you know, in high school, you know, and, uh, and my sisters, and I came up with at one point where they are, but they used to, they used to use their money. They would buy acha, snook fish, machangan vors. Hey, if you are not Tsonga, don't ever say machangan vors. You understand? It's only us the Shangans. Acha, snook fish, machangan vors. They would just. Phew. Now I used to save my money because I love to eat fruit. I love fruit. I'd save up my money to go buy fruit on Friday. And thankfully, at the school where we were, there was a feeding program. So I could go there and sort of get, and they went to the same school, by the way. Anyhow, let me not say. So I got, and I so always get, you know, milk and bread. That's what I ate the whole week. You know, brown bread, peanut butter, milk, that's all. Yeah. Bona, Coca-Cola, Machangan Vors, Snook Fishy, you know, Acha, mm, and Bunny Chow. That's what they had. I mean, really, you know. So Friday comes, I've got all this money. After school, I'd go, there was a cafe not far from home. I'd go to this uh, beautiful cafe and buy this fruit, beautiful fruit, bring it home and eat. I mean, eat there, eh? really eat. Now, come on, don't give me that look. I worked hard for this thing. Eh? My mother kept looking at that, and finally one day, when I was just about to eat, she said, uh, Musa, can you bring those fruit here? And she took all my fruit, Bazaram, really. I'm still struggling with unforgiveness and bitterness here. <laughs> she cut it up for my three sisters or four sisters. Can you imagine, Bazalana, a small an apple being cut into five pieces? And we got equal share. I didn't get the bigger piece. She distributed it equally among us all children. I was so angry. You must remember, these those days when you never answered your parents. Even if you don't like them, you can't say, I hate you. No, you can't. You just look at them. And I was seething, I was angry. I didn't understand. I have sacrificed. No, I didn't eat Acha and Machangan first. I sacrificed. How does it take me? But then it occurred to me. My mother is teaching me to share. Now let's get to today's exciting teaching. Do enjoy. What a gift family is. You know, you know sometimes you can see when, unfortunately, people didn't have that privilege to be raised in a home. You when know, someone never grew up in a home, it's very difficult, Bazalan. They learn things that are very difficult to correct. Now, even in the, when they're already grown up, they don't learn, you know, at home they teach you. If there's food, you don't just eat by yourself. You know, you don't say, it's Jehovah Jaira, and then eat everything, you know, you just don't say that, you, you wait for other people. There's an elderly lady I really loved, and she loved me too, you know. I would visit her sometimes because my, my, my sister and my brother-in-law lived next door to her. So when I went to visit, she would see me and she would say, hey, Musantana. And, and then she, she's quite, a, she raised children single-handedly. Very strict old lady, very good elderly lady. And, and I tell you, she taught her children. And, and so she tells me a story about her son who didn't want to take responsibility. I mean, this guy, you know, you know, he, he's been raised by the lady, taken to school, she worked so hard, and he finally finishes at school, gets a job, and his first salary, he buys himself expensive clothes. Topshire. <laughs> yeah, give me the names of the expensive. You know those, 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 Brand hood, yeah, why say brand hood, na? Yeah, Topshire, brand hood, and some flush -am shoes, several pairs. So the mother went to him and said, Sam, look, I don't say you must give me your money, but I mean, you can't even contribute a little bit of boarding and lodging. 
You're staying here in my house. You're working. You can see I'm a single parent. You can see how much I'm struggling. Now when you work and you get money, you can't even contribute. Well, the brother wouldn't listen. And this woman said, I'm going to solve this boy. I'm going to solve this boy. So one day she decided, she says to me, Mtanam, I decided I'm going to cook a three-course meal. Now, for you younger ones, you may not appreciate that, okay? In our day, we never used to have the privilege to eat meat during the week. We were very poor people. We didn't eat meat during the week. We only had pap, lisawa, or a papa calibis, all right? And not only that, even on Sunday, when we were supposed to be eating something that is very, we couldn't have dessert. We dessert only came Christmas time and New Year's time. Okay, so, so you got, I got to put that in context. But she decided during the week, she's going to cook three course meal, a starter, main meal, and dessert. Yeah. Not only is she going to cook that meal, she said, I set out the table, tablecloth. You must remember, we never had tablecloths during the week. Not on Sunday either. Only... <laughs> and then she got that crockery and cutlery that only comes out at Christmas time. Says when the kids arrived at home, they were shocked. Her girls and the boy, they were shocked. What's the occasion? And mama said, I'm in a good mood today. I decided to treat you well and really cook for you, my kids. So he said, kids, sit down. Brought, brings out the first course, soup, you know. Uh, uh, serves the girls, puts all the soup on there where the girls are seated and goes to the bedroom gets the pair of Flosham shoes. <laughs> puts them on a plate, brings them and puts them right in front of the, the son, the boy, and puts them there. And she's very serious, and you can feel the tension in the home. Everybody's looking. The girls are not sure whether to laugh or they don't know what to do. And she said, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the food that you are about to receive. You know the song. Amen. Then they started eating, and the brother is sitting there. <laughs> And then after that, she said, I, the girls tried to get up to clear up. I said, no, 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 girls. I'm today, I'm serving all of you. So she cleaned up, removed the shoes, removed everything, <laughs> brought the main course for the girls, went to the bedroom, got the Dobshire. <laughs> put, put it on the plate, put it there. Third meal. Serve the girls the dessert, went to the bedroom, brought the brand wood, <laughs> put it in front of the brother. And after that, she said, you don't even have to wash the dishes. I'll wash the dishes for you tonight. You can all go to bed. Next month. <laughs> the following month, when the brother got his salary, he came home and says, mama, mama. <laughs> An envelope that wasn't open those days when we used to get our salary in an envelope. What a gift that mother is. Yeah. What a gift you can be to your kids, eh? Yeah. We used to get uh, pocket money for school, you know, in high school, you know, and, uh, and my sisters, and I kept up with at one point where they are, but they used, to, they used to use their money. They would buy acha. Snook fish, machangan vors. Hey, if you are not Tsonga, don't ever say machangan vors. You understand? It's only us, the Shangans. <laughs> I just know. So I could go there and sort of get, and they went to the same school, by the way. So I'd get, and I saw, always get, you know, milk and bread. That's what I ate the whole week. You know, brown bread, peanut butter, milk, that's all. Yeah, bona, Coca-Cola, machangan vors, snook fishy, you know, acha, mm, and bunny chow. That's what they had, I mean, really, you know. So Friday comes, I've got all this money. After school, I'd go, there was a cafe not far from home. I'd go to this uh, beautiful cafe and buy 
this fruit, beautiful fruit, bring it home and eat. I mean, eat, eh? Really eat. Now, come on, don't give me that look. I worked hard for this thing. Eh? <laughs> My mother kept looking at that, and finally one day, when I was just about to eat, she said, uh, Musa, can you bring those fruit here? And she took all my fruit, Bazalam, really. <laughs> I'm still struggling with unforgiveness and bitterness here. <laughs> she cut it up for my three sisters or four sisters. Can you imagine, Bazalam, as morning an apple being cut into five pieces? And we got equal share. I didn't get the bigger piece. She distributed it equally among us all children. I was so angry. You must remember, these those days when you never answered your parents. Even if you don't like them, you can't say, I hate you. No, you can't. You just look at them. And... I was seething. I was angry. I didn't understand. I have sacrificed. No, I didn't eat. I sacrificed. How does it take me? But then it occurred to me, my mother is teaching me to share. Yeah. Yeah. Because see, there's, a, there's, a, there's an African proverb that says, I don't know how to say that in English. When, when one mouth is eating, it insults the other one. That's the literal translation. But, but what it means is, you can't just eat by yourself alone. It's, it's very un-African. We share whatever is there. Whatever little is there, we got to share. And my parents taught me that, my mom in particular. And you know, since that time, I learned how to share and to be generous. But it was a very difficult lesson to learn how to share. Since that time, I just learned, Kuru, okay, I might as well give them, you know, I might as well just buy and just give them, even if you give them the smallest name, but at least you have given, just give them. <laughs> so that can be safe with what I have but it cultivated a spirit of giving. Parents, what a gift you are to your children. What a gift the family is. Yeah. See, when God created an ordained family, he did, he did not do so without purpose and without design. See, God created family to be the context in which mankind could realize their potential and they could understand their eternal purpose, and they could understand the divine image of God they carry, and the dominion that they have, and they can actualize in their potential. All of that is meant to be fed in a home structure with a mom and a dad who loves you. You know, and as I look around in the church, I, I just never forget that some pictures I've seen. When I've seen some of the Men and women, as we come to know the Lord and as we learn about family, where we go into, on, onto a, on, into, into a, 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 a discipline of self-correcting, wherein, you know, we may have come from a background where these things were not even practiced. We may come from a very dysfunctional context. But listen, that you started that way, it doesn't mean that should be your future as well. Yeah, it, it, might, it might take longer to learn some things. See, if, if you never learned in a home structure certain things, it's, it takes much, it's more difficult to learn them when you're grown up. But the power of the Holy Spirit is there. Yeah. I said the power of the Holy Spirit is there. Yeah. If you have the will and the determination to learn new things, you know, it, it can be a good thing. I, I watched at one of the programs we have with the men, the Line Crossers program, and I was watching this guy with his daughter, teenage daughter, you know, they were talking and hugging and, and kissing, and you could see that they're really enjoying one another's company. They're discussing, and, and I'm looking at this young girl thinking, what a gift this man is to this young girl, and how fortunate this young girl is to, to get to experience the love of a man that has no sexual connotations. Yeah. 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 Where she... She's loved genuinely for who she is with no ulterior motive. And it's a pure, genuine, masculine love that doesn't objectify her. And I thought, what a powerful, strong woman she'll grow up to be. She'll be able to differentiate these loves, and there's no guy who's going to lie to her. You know, we lie to you ladies, and we say, you mean the world to me? I 
I am not complete without you. And I know this is all poetic talk. I know it's all poetic talk, but you know, Bazalana, to be honest with you, no human being can meet all your needs. I'm telling you, there's no human being who can do it. No man can, no woman can. And a little now when we say I'm incomplete, oh, but like God <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, what a shock. <laughs> <laughs> this girl, this 16-year-old girl, there's no guy's going to lie to her. She's going to grow up to be a strong woman, an independent woman, self-conscious, full of passion, who will know the difference between true love and exploitative love. What a gift. What a gift. What a gift. When you raise young men, boys, to know how to treat women right. Young men who are not going to objectify women. Who are not going to treat women as sex objects. Who are going to understand that women are human like the rest of us. Young men who are going to grow up to take responsibility. Uh, and work at home and clean the house. And, 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 and know how to honor in a home. And not grow up with a twisted personality of anger and revenge. Wanting to kill the whole world because daddy was never there. Oh, what a gift you are to your family, eh? Can you imagine that? God gives a home for that. Hallelujah. In Genesis 1, 26, God says, let us make men in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and, and multiply and fill the earth. And subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea. Over the birds of the air. Over every living thing that moves on the earth. God blesses a man and a woman who come together in covenant. In marriage. And God blesses them. Is to be the God-ordained context for the establishment of the following things. Number one, for the establishment and the development of God-centered relationships. God is the one who brought the man and the woman together. And if the man and the woman try to get it on without God being there and without God being the center of everything, no wonder things fall apart. And so God wants these relationships to be God-centered relationships. See, Basalana, relationships that really are just based on other things. They're based on wealth. They're based on looks. They're based on who is cool. They never will last. There's got to be something more than just the looks. Because looks wear off after a while. Are you there, Basalana? Things can change that can make someone who's super rich to be a pauper overnight. It's going to be something more than that. So God wants our relationships to be centered on him. God-centered relationships and God-centered fellowships. This is why it's important as the Bible encourages us that as a Christ follower, when you start a family, make sure that whoever you get married to is a Christ follower as well. Paul tries to teach this in the book of Corinthians. He says, light cannot be equally yoked with darkness. He says, don't be unequally yoked with the unbeliever. Oftentimes when we try to explain this to people, people think we are just being nasty and we don't understand how much they are in love with each other. The truth is when the reality of life sinks in, when the challenges of life come through, when you go through times of sickness and disease and challenge, when children are born, when you come to some of the most sacred things, that is where your core beliefs get exposed. If someone has never been a follower of Christ and they don't have the discipline of going to church, reading the Bible or praying, but you marry them because of their beautiful dimple. <laughs> oh, the brother has got a very wide voice. <laughs> hey, baby. And when he said, hey, baby, you became weak at your knees. <laughs> if that's the only reason you are getting married to them and you never ask about the centrality of God in their lives. 
When you're married, you go through problems. You go through challenges. And it is those problems that reveal what your core beliefs are. It is when things are hard where you run to whatever you are familiar with. If alcohol is what you run to when there's trouble, you're going to run to alcohol when there's trouble in your home. If you never learn to be a disciplined guy and you're a player, when you start having challenges in the home and you can't get it on, then you'll cheat because you do not have values. Or as a lady, you'll go and get yourself a Ben 10. Oh, so ladies, you don't want me to say Ben 10, eh? I can say the guys are cheating, I can't say you Ben 10. Okay, explain to your neighbor what a Ben 10 is. Just explain to them what a, just explain to them, they don't know what a Ben 10 is. No, it's not a Ben 9, it's a Ben 10. No, no, no. And explain why it's 10 and not 12. Just explain to them why it's a Ben 10. Ah, Jesus. <laughs> but the family is that God-ordained context where God-centered relationships are, are developed. It is in the family where it's the context for the establishment and the development of God-like character. It's in a home where we've got to teach people to have good character, to know how to say, I'm sorry, thank you, please. Do you know how to address people? No. I was sharing in the first service, was I'm, I'll be thankful to God till my last day on earth. And the day we go to heaven, I will always thank God for the, the privilege of being raised by good parents. I don't ever remember once in our home hearing anybody swearing. Not once. My father never swore. I never ever remember my father drinking or smoking. Not once. Cheating on my mom. Never. Or being abusive. Not once. No. Not once. Not once. Hey. What a gift. What a gift. Some of the things, but it's not so much because we're such good Christian. If you, if you grow up in a place where good things are normalized, at home, when we celebrated, there was no alcohol. So even when we had marriages, we never, there was no alcohol at our uh, wedding, my wife and uh, my sister says, no alcohol. Some people, when they, when they want to be happy and celebrate, hey, look at your neighbor and say, Kare Bishop Ogubon, right? Hey! And you know, I'll do, a, I'll do a whole presentation on the issue of alcohol. It's, there are studies now that are very concerning about the abuse of alcohol in our nation. Very concerning. I'm telling you, Basalad. I know you don't like it. I know you don't like it. But I'm not going to try and preach because you like it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a servant of God. I'm going to preach to our society, all right? Yeah. There are very, very concerning studies about alcohol abuse and also the phenomenon of the broken family. My heart broke the other day. I was, I was speaking to my brother-in-law, and they were, they were sharing with me with my sister how the phenomenon of the reality of uh, uh, the dysfunctional home, and some of it is not on purpose. It's just circumstantial. Find this lady. She's a single parent woman raising children. You know, whatever the situation is, we don't know. We're not judging anybody. But then she gets a job, and you find the only job she has, she can only work night shift. Yeah. So here is, she has to work at night, away from her kids, right? So then the older kid now has to become the parent. Imagine a child having to think about what meal are we going to eat tonight? Having to, to ensure that the younger ones have got everything they need for school. They wash them, they dress them, they so on. You know, when they said that, my heart broke. I thought, sheesh, sheesh, this is the reality where we live. And I was saying to myself when I was praying, God, how do we help here? Do we really understand? Do we really understand the reality of where people live? There are many child-headed homes that are there. Maybe we have to try and agitate for more foster care. Maybe some of you, Christian parents, you've already raised your kids. You already have an empty nest. Maybe we should find a way in which we can give some child a chance in life. What do you say, Vazal? Hmm? Hmm? Raise them. At least give them a little bit of a taste of what normality is. You know, this I can't 
I kind of raised from my heart. And I think I will forever, I will forever feel sorry for what I did. I've forgiven me, but it was one of the most painful lessons I learned. There's a, a home of abandoned children that we work very closely with as a church. And these kids live on this home, as you call it. And it just so happened our church was near this particular home of these kids. And they came to our church and they became part of our church. They attended our Sunday school, our children's church. And I got to know many of them. And you know how I love kids. I'd always play with them and so on. So one day I, I happened to go via the, that home. And I was on a tight schedule, unfortunately. I was rushing for a meeting in Randberg. So I had to just go there and drop something and leave. All right. Just that kind of day. Okay. So as I drove in, I didn't notice that the kids were somewhere. They saw me when I came in. Okay. So in my own rushed way, I ran into the admin block, did whatever I did. And as I rushed out, I saw the kids playing. I, I greeted them from far, but I never stopped long enough to listen to what they were saying. And as I, as, I, as I was driving out, waving to them, one of the caretakers came to me and said, did, did, did you hear what the children are singing? I said, no. <laughs> but Alana, these kids had composed a song on the spot, celebrating that their pastor has come to see them. I told them. They were, they were singing and dancing. And, 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 and here I am, I'm rushing off. I stopped and I thought, I, I, I didn't know who, what we mean to these kids. That as much as we're running a church, we, we are a parent too. I don't know. I, I tried, I was with them, but I was so broken and felt so condemned that I was very awkward. And I tried to do it. But as I left, I couldn't get it. Since then, I made a decision. We believe in dreams. We believe in dreams. Well, that's where we leave it for today. We hope you are blessed by this awesome word. Until next time, God bless.